Hello, this is Pastor Bella, Alex Nosagye. Good evening, God girls, and welcome to part 11 of Husbands of the Bible. We're in HOTV 11 tonight, and we are looking at Job. Yes, the Lord has been laying him on my heart, and tonight we are going into the life of Job. I know the body of Christ as a whole, people are going through so much. But remember our key scripture, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. The Amplified says, Wives, submit to your own husbands in service to God. So submission is showing God, serving God, pleasing God, submission to our husbands. We are, in fact, pleasing God. And again, I've emphasized from the very beginning, submit to your own husband. Your husband is unique. You need to get to know your husband, get to know his likes, his dislikes, and above all, your husband needs to be submitted to the Most High God. Okay, when your husband is submitted to God, then it's very easy for you to submit to him because he is in line with the Word of God. But then when he is not submitted to God, that's why we are looking through this series so you can learn the good and learn the bad, learn from the bad husbands, learn from the husbands who made mistakes, learn from the godly husbands who still made mistakes because we're human. So tonight we're looking at Job. The story of Job is very familiar, but God still wants to teach us something with his life. I'm reading from the Amplified. Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who reverently feared God and abstained from and shunned evil because it was wrong. Job was a righteous man. Job was truly a godly man. He was upright. He was all about God. He was all about God. Remember, I've told the single God girls, you have to look out for a godly man, don't compromise on that. He must love God and he must fear God because I can assure you submission will go a whole lot easier for you if your husband is submitted to God. Job was upright. He was blameless. Can you imagine God looking down on one of us and we're just blameless before him? That's amazing. Job was righteous. But that did not prevent him from going into tragedy. And I think the Lord wants us to focus on that tonight because I don't know about you. I was a naive Christian growing up. And I felt like, oh, I'm a Christian, so only good stuff will happen to me. That's because I was reading my Bible, but I wasn't really identifying with the characters in the Bible. For whatever reason, I thought Bella would be different. But everyone God uses goes through tragedy. You cannot avoid it. You cannot avoid it as a Christian. You're going to go through stuff. You're going to go through stuff as a child of God. So I love the way the book of Job starts out where you see this man, his righteous, his upstanding, blameless before the Lord. I mean, you can go ahead and say, wow, this is this was God's favorite child. Because I found out when I became a parent that when I have a child that obeys me, the love that I have for that child really increases than if you keep disobeying me. But then I'm not God, right? And that's why the book of John says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Obeying God shows that we love him. When you have children and they obey your instruction, it makes your heart so full of joy. So look at Job. Job was doing everything right. And, and I know the Lord was pleased with him. And so the Lord blessed him. The Lord will bless you as a righteous child. Verse 2, and there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 
500 female donkeys and a very great body of servants so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. He was prosperous. He was a righteous and prosperous man. He had everything going for him. But disaster is coming. Life is in seasons. A lot of us are young today, but you're going to get old by the grace of God. And when you get old, if any of you have lived with old people, you see what it's like to be old. You wake up this morning, this part of your body is paining you. You wake up this morning, oh, all of a sudden you can't see all that well. You wake up this morning and oh, it's a little effort to get up. Not like before where you could just jump up from the bed and start your day. Old age is coming. So you cannot avoid it. You cannot say, Lord, I don't want to be old. But you're telling him you don't want to be old and you're ready to die, right? You can't avoid the pain that comes with the more you live this life. You will experience loss. There's a time in my life, my parents, both my parents were still alive. But then there's a time in my life that I've lost my mom. I experienced loss. Because mom can't live forever and dad can't live forever on this side of the earth. They'll live forever in heaven. So there will come a time in your life that you'll become aware where you may have everything and then all of a sudden you lose everything. Yes, the more you live, the more you're going to go through stuff. All right? His sons used to go and feast in the house of each on his birthday. In turn... And they invited their three sisters to eat and drink with them. I hope you understand what that means. <laughs> All right. So it was a very close-knit family. And they used to go from house to house celebrating with each other. That's the person's birthday. So it was a close-knit family. And look at, look at this interesting thing that Job used to do on behalf of his children. Verse 5. And when the days of their feasting were over, Job sent for them to purify and hallow them. And rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed or disowned God in their hearts. Thus did Job at all such times. Job was, was a godly man. He was a godly father. He was interceding. You see, you see, you see the importance of being married to a praying man? I love it when men pray. Look at him covering his family in prayers. Praying for them. To purify them in case they're partying too hard. In case they had sinned against the Lord, he got up to intercede for his family. So chapter 1 is really setting the tone for the kind of man Job was. He was a good man. He was a, a godly man. He was a great father. And of course, being a great father and a good man and a godly man, I know he was a good husband. Yes, he was. Because once God abides in you, his goodness will flow out of you. You can't say you have God and then you're a wicked wife. No. If God is in you, he will flow out of you. So I know Job was a good husband because he's proven right here he's a good father. Oh, but Job... Job is about to experience some things. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Those are the angels of the Lord. And Satan, the adversary and accuser, also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where did you come? And Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down. And look at him, just looking for who to mess with. Always busy. That's why you can't relent as a Christian. The devil's just looking for something. He's looking to cause trouble. Just roaming all over the earth. Just looking to create havoc and chaos. That's why you need a vibrant prayer life. Can't joke around with it. The devil is always roaming. Looking for who to devour. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who reverently fears God and abstains from and shuns evil because it is wrong? You know, it's amazing that God is actually discussing with the devil. And God is proud of his child. You know, that's how it is when you have good children. You, I mean, you're, you're proud of them. And so God is talking about his son Job proudly. That, yeah, I got one of those. I got one of those Good children, godly, blameless, and you know, he's actually talking to the devil. Wow. <laughs> and the devil being evil as he is, 
answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have conferred prosperity and happiness upon him and the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Do you see how wicked the devil is? And does this sound familiar to you? Do you Have you run into human beings that are like this? When you're doing so well, they're speaking out of spite and jealousy. That's where the spirit comes from, from the devil. The devil is a divider. He's all about strife and jealousy and mockery. And they're human beings that carry his spirit. Look at the way he's talking to God that, oh yeah, Job, Job is all about you because Job is prosperous. Why don't you take everything away from Job? And then we see if Job still loves you. And God actually considers doing that, and God actually does that. And the Lord said to Satan, the adversary and accuser, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon the man himself put not forth your hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. As a Christian, bad things will happen to you. And when those bad things are happening to you, be aware of something. The book of Job shows us something very, it's so glaring. The devil can only mess with you when God gives him permission. And you also give the devil permission by living a sinful life. But if you're living a righteous life like Job, the devil needs permission from God to mess with you. And so Satan has gotten his permission. He's going to devastate Job right now. Seriously. Whew. This book of the Bible. This husband. Job as a husband. We're looking at him as a husband, but in order to look at him as a husband, you have to look at him as a man. Because your husband is first of all a man before he becomes your husband. What is the character of your husband? What is the character of the man? Before you say, oh, yes, I'll be your wife. I'll be glad to marry you. Are you looking at the character, single God girls, of the man who's approaching you? Are you seeing if the fruit of the Holy Spirit is in his life? Is he righteous before the Lord? Does he take the Lord seriously? Is he a praying man? Is he a kind of man that will hold your hands and pray with you? Is he someone that looks forward to having children with you? I mean, look at the life of Job. He was a godly man. You need to marry a godly man as a god girl. You cannot compromise on that. You cannot. That's where it starts from. The character of the man. When we were looking at Joseph, I told you, I said, there is no way Joseph would ever cheat on his wife because I've seen his character from the time he was a, a young man. To when he grew up, he was faithful in service to God. When a man is faithful in service, faithful in his relationship with God, you think he's going to just get up and cheat on you? Yeah, and then we go to David and be like, what happened to David? And of course, go through the teaching on David so you can understand what happened to David. So Job was upright. And now everything is about to be taken from him. Verse 13, and there was a day when Job's sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house on his birthday. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians swooped down upon them and took away the animals. Indeed, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Devastation has started. While he was yet speaking. Look at that. Sometimes trouble comes in waves. As you just discover a problem, another one is coming behind it. I call it like the contractions of a woman when we're about to give birth. If any of you have ever been pregnant before and given birth, you know the painful contractions when they come in waves. As you're getting over this wave and you think, oh, you're going to be relieved. No, no, no. Another one's coming and it's painful. That's what Job is going through right now. He's just getting over the shock of losing his animals and his servants. And then another one's coming to deliver bad news. There came also another and said, The fire of God, lightning has fallen from the heavens and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. <laughs> it's funny that <laughs> they think that they're the only ones escaping. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans have divided into three bands and made a raid upon the camels and have taken them away, yes, and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. My goodness, Job is like, what is going on? Here comes another one. 
While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great whirlwind from the desert and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. That was, that was the climax of Job's suffering. I was telling you all about my phone recently, right? And how my children were apologizing to me about, oh, mommy, we're sorry you lost your phone. I said, no, I'd rather lose this phone than lose one of you. You can lose animals. You can lose your business. It's going to hurt, yeah? Uh, you can start all over again. They, they're replaceable. You can figure, but when you lose a child, just one child, the words are not even in the dictionary to, to explain how you will feel. Job had seven children. All of them were taken from him. All seven. What do you expect this man to do? Again, I'm surprised he didn't just have a heart attack and just fall down and die. I'm surprised that a lot of people, when devastation comes, you see them so angry at God and abu abusing God and all that. Look at what Job did. I want you to pay attention to what Job did. There's a teaching that I taught on called the futility of why, and I referred to Job. I referred to Job's initial reaction when bad news kept on coming and coming and coming. I'm telling you, if God is in you, he will pour out of you. This is a man that spent time with God, spent time relating with God, and that's why his reaction his reaction was a blessing to God. I'm telling you, God, girls, don't joke around with your praying life. That's where you draw strength from. It's not every day that's going to be a good day. But if you have a strong praying life, you can prevail. If you have a strong worship life, you can prevail. If you have a strong word life, you can always prevail. You can overcome. You get to live another day. But when you're in the flesh and you're just a naive Christian, a baby Christian, and you think it's going to be all good all the time, then you don't know how to handle tragedy when it comes. Tragedy has come to Job. Tragedy has come to the man who did everything right. Everything right. And yet in one day, he lost everything. Major losses. To lose your livelihood is a big major loss. Some people lose their businesses and commit suicide. That's not enough. He loses his servants. And you know him being a godly man, he's going to be full of love. He's going to take care of his servants, take care of his household. That's a devastating loss. He's still trying to get over that. And then you won't tell me that all seven of his children are dead? But look at his reaction. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Job worshipped. He did not run around helter-skelter crying and all over. He went straight into the presence of God. He went straight into his praying altar. He went straight and gave it all to God. That is only from spiritual maturity. When bad things happen, where do you go? Who is your first place to go? When good things happen, where do you go? Some of you, you have good news. The first person you want to call is a human being. No, no, uh. When something good happens to me, the first thing I say is, thank you, Jesus. When something bad happens to me, the first thing I say is, Lord, help me. Thank you, Lord, that it could have been much worse. I don't fully understand it, but Lord, I thank you because you saw it. And I know that you're with me and you will get me through this. He's always the first person I talk to. When I wake up in the morning, he's the first person I'm talking to. I don't have time for no human being. Because when I was in the bottom of the pit, it was God who was there with me. No human being was in that pit with me. No human being could drag me out and make me feel all right again. It was God himself. And it took tragedy for me to find my God. It took devastation. For me to find my God. When Super Eva shares her testimony, you can understand why she is always so ignited, so full of fire, so sold out to the kingdom of God. Because she has experienced devastation, devastating loss. Sometimes it takes that to wake you up for you to know who God is. That's what it took for me to wake up. And I laid it all down just like Job. I laid down on the floor and I said, Father, I'm not getting up from this floor until I feel you because I don't even know how to get out of this situation. I need you. 
And that's when full surrender began. And that's when I started to walk with the Lord. Yes, I was a Christian, but was I walking with the Lord? I was still doing my own thing. Life was good. But when life wasn't good, no human being could help me but God himself. That's why it is important to preserve your relationship with God. Because you're going to go through some things in life and you know that human beings will disdain you. They will mock you. They will run away from you. And it's only God that will be there with you. Look at Job. He worshipped the Lord with tears in his eyes, with pain in his heart. He got on his knees and he worshipped the Lord. I applaud this man. That is a godly man. That is a godly man. And may godly men arise in this generation. Don't play around with it, single God girls. It is so beautiful to see a man serious with his relationship with God. When he's serious about God, he'll be serious about you. I'm telling you, it's a peaceful marriage you will have when you're married to a godly man. And when you're not, <laughs> woo, storms are coming. And they don't blow over quickly. Verse 21, and said, naked came I into this world from my mother's womb, and naked shall I depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed, praised, and magnified, and worship be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. How many of us can do that? How many of us? But the reason the, the book of Job is 42 chapters long is when you're in the trial, when you're in the fire, it will get to a point that you start asking God questions. The pain will just be too much and you're going to be communing with God. But as long as you're talking to God, you're fine. It's therapeutic. You need to lay it all out before God because no human being can understand. Let's go into chapter two. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down and on it. Look at this devil. He's not done. He's not, <laughs> he's not done causing trouble. He's still looking for who to mess around with. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who reverently fears God and abstains from and shuns all evil and still holds fast his integrity, although you moved me against him to destroy him without cause. Look at what the Lord himself says. Look at what the Lord, I'm telling you, this book is powerful. I don't know if it doesn't blow your mind that God is talking to the devil like this. He's actually talking to the devil like an acquaintance. He's talking to the devil. And he's telling the devil, you're the one who made me do it. You're the one who moved me against him to destroy him without cause. The Bible is so interesting. God, girls, when something bad happens to you, understand that bad things may happen to you, but God is still a good God. That's what you need to remember. He's with you. In the fire, he's with you. God is with you. It doesn't feel like it, but he's with you. He's aware of every single thing that you are going through. But I'm telling you, this book is so encouraging because it shows you that when God takes you through stuff and he brings you out of that stuff, <laughs> it is beautiful. That's when you enter the phase of Ephesians 3.20. When God turns your captivity around, Psalm 126. When you get into the phase of 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Oh my goodness, when God restores and turns things around and gives you double portion, go to Isaiah 61. I love walking with God. He takes you through, but he brings you out of it in such a beautiful and powerful way that you'll be even thanking him for the loss that you went through. Because if you didn't go through that loss, those greater blessings would have never come your way. You got to let go. And let the Lord have his way in your life. It's going to hurt. But you will be better for it. Remember I've told you before that suffering chisels out the character of Christ in you. You cannot be Christ-like without suffering. You cannot have compassion for humanity if you've never experienced pain. You cannot understand how poor people feel if you've never lacked. Or hungry people feel if you've never gone hungry. you got to suffer. You have to. You must go through a season of suffering so you can understand compassion and how to care for your neighbors. 
Not to be selfish. Everything's good all the time. You will not understand when the world is being is suffering. You will not. So you have to go through it to be Christ-like. Hmm. Oh, this book. All right. Verse 6. And the Lord said to Satan, Then Satan answered the Lord, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has will he give for his life. But put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse and renounce you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan is still trying to prove God wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've taken everything from Job. But you know what? Uh, you told me not to touch him. Um, okay, skin for skin. Let me now touch his skin. Let me wound him. And let's see if he's not going to curse you. So God again gives permission. So you can see for evil to come upon you, the Lord himself will give permission if you're living a righteous life. But if you're living unrighteously, you give the devil the authority to come into your life and mess around with you. Okay? But if you're living righteously like Job and bad things happen, please know that God is very aware and it's not of any reason of what you did. But God will bring you through it. So be encouraged. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Smote Job with loathsome and painful sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. This is the lowest of the low. Lord, you took everything from me and now you're taking my health from me. And it's not even a sickness that I can hide. It's something that when people look at me, I'm definitely like who I was before. I was a prosperous man. I had everything going on. I was one of the wealthiest men here. And look at me now here just with boils and sores all over my body. Think of the social stigma. It's like when someone had leprosy back in the day. So you haven't only lost your wealth. Of course, people are going to dump you because of that. But now you have this strange illness. Oh, people are really going to dump you. They don't want to be around you. They'll be like, uh-uh, this one's bad news, bad luck. Can you imagine the mockery he would have faced, Job? Oh. Verse 8, and he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself, and he sat down among the ashes. Yeah, it's itchy. So he's using something to scratch himself. Very uncomfortable. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your blameless uprightness? Renounce God and die. Another version says, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. I want to stop here for a minute. God, girls, marriage is in seasons. Marriage is in seasons. Make sure you stand by your husband when he has nothing and you stand by your husband when he has everything. Do you understand me? You must stand by your husband and pray with your husband and know that you're in a season. If you're in a season of suffering, you need to support him through it. You're his helper. A helpmate, mate, comparable, suitable for your husband. Don't be like Mrs. Job, telling Job to curse his God and die. Why didn't she tell Job to curse God when all things were good? But now look at the voice of the devil speaking through her. It's very painful when your nearest and dearest betray you. And they tell you to turn away from God. They tell you you're stupid. You're going to go through that season when people think you're stupid for serving God. You're foolish. Come and do it this way. You don't need to suffer. You don't need to. You need some money. What's your holiness going to do for you? Why don't you just come have sex with me and then I'll give you money? Yeah, a lot of girls are forced to... Sleep with men in order to survive. That's how prostitution begins. But a God girl cannot do that. You must go through your season of suffering with God and trust God. Look at his wife. The closest person to him on earth is mocking him. That's not what you do as a godly wife. You stand by your husband. You nurse him through his sickness. It's a trial for both of you. It's not just his trial. You're in marriage to him. Marriage with him. So the trial is for both of you. Same thing for the man listening to this message. When your wife is down, you got to be up. When the husband is down, the wife got to be up. You lift each other up. You don't, you don't turn against each other. You don't abuse each other, belittle each other. Look, that's what Mrs. Job is doing. She's telling him, curse God and die. I mean, look, look at you. All you have left is integrity. And what, what good is integrity for us? What good is your righteousness right now? We've lost everything. I mean, she's lost all her children, so of course she's going to be bitter. She's going to be bitter. And you will be bitter when God takes you through devastation. You're going to go through moments of, why me, Lord? Lord, why? Why? Why, Lord? Why? 
But I love how Job responded to her. He said to her, you speak as one of the impious. <laughs> okay, that's the amplified. Let me read from the NIV. <laughs> he replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Look at the wisdom. Is it only good we should accept from God? What about trouble? Yeah, trouble comes too. As a servant of God, as a child of God. And when it comes, you need to accept it. Just like when you lose a loved one, you need to accept it, that it was time for that loved one to go. You need to accept it and not be crying and getting angry at God. Come on. It's the Lord who gives and the Lord who takes away. That's what Job is telling us. So you accept it. You accept the loss and you worship the Lord. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came each one from his own place, Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come, to condole with him, and to comfort him. And when they looked from afar off and saw him disfigured beyond recognition, they lifted up their voices and wept, and each one tore his robe, and they cast dust over their heads toward the heavens. So they sat down with Job on the ground for seven days and seven nights, and none spoke a word to him. For they saw that his grief and pain were very great. He experienced great loss. But he did not turn away from God. That's what we learned from Job. He still held on to God. Yeah, you keep reading in the chapters. You see where he, he has such a hard time. He goes into an emotional roller coaster. Because he, he's trying to understand how this devastation came upon him. But God really doesn't explain it. Because this, what happened with Job was the sovereignty of God. There's some things, there's some tragedies that will happen in your life that God will never, ever, ever explain. I go back to the story of Joseph and Jacob. Jacob walked with God, yet God took away his beloved son for 22 years. This beloved son was being groomed by God to be a savior for his people. But yet, even though Jacob walked with God, God did not let Jacob know that Joseph was alive for 22 years. Do you imagine the pain that Jacob went through mourning for his son, a son that was alive in another land? For 22 years, God hid that from him. There's some things that God will never let you understand or let you know, and you need to be fine with it. That's called the sovereignty of God. God doesn't have to explain himself to you. He is God. He is God. He can do anything. He is God. He doesn't have to explain himself to you. He just wants you to trust him and love him. Because at the end of the day, he is a good God. The Bible is proof to us that God is a good God. He is good and that's all you need to know. You don't need to fully understand what God is or who he is or what he's about. You just need to trust him. Trust in his wisdom. Trust that he knows better than you. Trust that he's the Alpha and Omega. He knows the ending from the beginning. You just need to trust the Lord your God. Stay thankful through your seasons. Learn that from Job. Keep your godliness when trials are coming at you. Some of you trials come at you and that's when you want to turn away from God. That's the biggest mistake you'll ever make. Stay with God in your trial. You become a better human being. You become a better child of God. The son of God himself was not spared from suffering. So who are you to be spared from suffering? I really need to break that misconception because I was one of those Christians thinking that I'm a Christian so bad things are not supposed to happen to me. But bad things happened to me. Almost destroyed me. But for the grace of God. And when I found my voice, the lioness must roar. No one is ever going to silent this voice again. Because the Lord gave me a voice. And that's why I am sold out to the Lord. Whatever he asked me to do, I will do. He is now first in my life, not any human being. He is first. He is first. And to work with me, God better be first in your life. Because I'm not compromising my relationship with God for no human being. Because when I lost everything, he was the only one who was there to pick me up and put me back together again. I was like a broken piece of pottery in Job's hands. I was broken and he built me up. I was at the verge of insanity and he gave me a sound mind. 
Oh, this God, how can I not serve him? How can I not follow him? My God is everything. I don't care what he takes me through. I know he sees the end and from the beginning. I know that his thoughts towards me are of good and never of evil. I will trust him that he'll bring it to an expected end. His promises are yea and amen. That is the God that I serve. Husbands of the Bible, stand by your godly husband. When God takes him through a great trial, stand by him. Don't tell your husband to turn away from God. Don't bring a, across a shady business deal because your family's hungry. You need to cry out to God to feed you and God will feed you. The Lord who sent ravens to Elijah is still the God of today. The Lord who filled the widow of Zarephath's house with oil so she could keep making bread is still alive today. That's the God that we serve. Don't forget who God is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You stand with God. You stand up for God and he will stand up for you. I'm not going to read the whole 42 chapters of Job. You can do that in your own time, but I'm taking you to chapter 42. I'm just letting you know that even if Job did not confront God initially, he did. He had to. It's tough when you just keep you just keep suffering and you're you're wondering why, Lord, why? Why? Lord, what's going on? Lord, what happened? It'll even get to a point that you think you sinned against God. But God restores. God restores. God is awesome. The friends who came to sit around Job. They ended up displeasing the Lord because they came trying to debate, trying to offer comfort. But at the end of the day, the advice that were given Job, God was having none of it. And God cautions them in chapter 42. So that's where I'm going to end this message. Job is now with the Lord. They're talking. And the Lord has finally decided to explain some things to Job. And Job then repents to the Lord. That's what happens if you have a relationship with God. You're going to repent. Even if you get angry and you don't understand and you have this woe is me mentality, you're feeling sorry for yourself, you know, you come back to God and say, Father, have mercy. I'm so sorry. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears ha had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job had an encounter with the Lord. Your trial will bring you closer to God, and it will make you repent before him. Because at the end of the day, you and I, we are lesser beings. We can't be questioning God. He chooses to answer what he wants to answer. There's questions I've been asking the Lord. It's just in this season, he finally answered me. I've been asking him this question for years. He finally answered me in this season. And I just thanked him. I said, Lord, because you, you could have not answered me, but now you have answered me. So thank you. Thank you for your mercy and your graciousness. He finally answered me. So keep asking the Lord. With the right heart, though, the right motive. Don't, don't address God disrespectfully, please. Don't ever do that. Say, Father, I'm hurt. I don't understand. I love you. Please console me. Please help me understand. That's how you approach God. You don't make demands on him. Mm -mm. He is God. He is your creator. So verse 7, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So again, I want you to see the mercy of God over Job. Because Job, if you read through the book, you'll see that sometimes Job was just too confrontational with God. His emotions was an emotional roller coaster. You have a good day, you have a bad day. I mean, you get tired of your trying. You're going to start asking God some serious questions. But yet God was not displeased with Job. Because Job approached God with humility, repentant before God. You must be cognizant of who God is. Approach him with humility. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. I want you to take note of that. Twice as much. When God takes something away from you, when he brings it back, it's going to be more. Ephesians 3.20. It's going to be more. More than you could ever have asked or thought. Exceedingly abundantly more. That's why you stick with God. Because the restoration he's bringing is life changing. It's better than what you had before better 
Verse 11, then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house, and they sympathized with him and comforted him over all the distressing calamities that the Lord had brought upon him. I want you to take note of that. The calamities that the Lord had brought upon him. When bad things happen, it's not always the devil. Sometimes the Lord lets bad things happen to you. Yeah, the Bible just proves it right now. He's a good God, but he'll let bad things happen to you because he's God all by himself. And those bad things will teach you a lesson and they will draw you closer to him. All right, that's the sovereignty of God. You got to know this God. Your husband got to know this God. Your children got to know this God. You got to love this God and reverence this God and live for this God because this God is too much. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep. Remember, 7,000 were taken from him. 6,000 camels, 3,000 were taken from him. 1,000 yoke of oxen, he had 500 before. And 1,000 female dogs, he had 500 before. Look at the Lord. Look at the Lord. Look at the Lord. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And in all the land, there were no women as fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even to four generations. So Job died an old man and full of days. God, girls, I have to stop here. But do you understand the importance of being married to a godly man who stands with God through thick and thin? Oh, you will be better for it. God, girl, stand by your godly husband. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. You go through rough patches, hold on to God tightly, the both of you, and all shall be well. God loves you, and I love you. This is Pastor Bella, Alex Nosage, Ultimate God Girl. God bless you.